Joining me this week is a human rights activist who grew up in a place not too kind to free thinkers. Currently, he's the Middle East Community Manager of Movements.org, an organization dedicated to opening closed societies. He also happens to be in Los Angeles for the first time right this very second. Faisal Saeed al Matar, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. I mean, I thank you for bringing sanity to all all the world. I, I've been a big fan of your show since it started. So wow, I'm, I'm, I'm very sanity, sanity to all of the world. I would I would say so because like I, I've seen your video being shared of like some of my friends who live in in the Middle East and and, and they were all talking about you. So yeah, I mean it's uh, it's really great to be here. All right, that's very rewarding. We could probably end the show right there. But, uh, we'll <laughs> yeah. talk we'll talk a little bit about you as well. So uh, I want to talk about your personal story and coming from Iraq and all that, which is really it's really a wonderful story and it's. So uh, perfectly lined up with a lot of things we've been talking about here. But first, I want to talk about how I came to know you. Uh, because the second episode that we did of this show on Aura, I had Cara Santa Maria on. And uh, a few days before that, she had been tweeting that she was in contact with someone that knew somebody in Saudi Arabia that was outed as a secularist or an atheist and was in trouble. Their life was yeah. being threatened, I think, by their father. Yeah. And your name then got looped into this. Yeah. And then this is a direct through to what you do at movements.org. So can you just tell me a little bit about that instance? Yeah, I mean, that was a pretty interesting case, to say the least, uh, is that, so the man is comes from Saudi Arabia, and uh, and he, he also happens to be a lucky one because he does have an American passport, so he lives in the United States. And he went to like into a discussion with his father on the dinner table, and he told him, he didn't even say like he's an atheist, he just said that he has some doubts about God and things of that sort. And the end result of that conversation is that his dad threatened him that he's gonna report him to the authorities. And that actually means in a country like Saudi Arabia, which is literally, Death, or you're gonna get lashed like our friend Raif Badawi. Yeah. Um, so f uh, he started contacting a lot of secular organizations, like, this is my story, I'm, I'm, uh, I need help, and things of that sort. And he came across Kara, and Kara made that, like, she said, like, oh, I have a friend in Saudi, like, I have somebody in Saudi Arabia, and and I kind of became the direct person. To, uh, somebody tagged me on the fo on the post because that's my work. That I try to help activists in close societies. Right. So basically, Kara tweeted something saying, "I would like to help this person, but I don't know what to do." Yes, and that's where you jumped. Yeah, in. and that's where I, I jumped in, and uh, I also jumped in in like trying to verify if his story is is true. And I went back and forth in conversation with him to see, uh, like, if because I mean we have tons and tons of cases. And it's very important to know which ones are true to the case because every case takes take long time. Like mm -hmm. nothing gets solved. So I try to make uh, so we have a vetting system in which we make sure that these stories are, are legit. And then so what do you do? Like what does the vetting system actually entail to find out if this guy is actually telling the truth and not just somebody that wants to get out of the country for other reasons? Yeah, I mean, I mean, as somebody who is a refugee myself. Uh, there are certain questions that somebody can know whether this, like you can ask them specific questions about, uh, about what what they what did they really say to their parents and uh, whether like how is their relationship with their parents? You know if that is actually like his dad is really crazy enough to report him to the like to get literally get his son killed like yeah. it's uh, and. Uh, try to see like what he's trying to achieve, like when he want, why he wants to leave, like what he's trying to achieve when he wants to leave, and and things of that sort, and try to connect if he does know other circles and other friends that go like through his Facebook friends, and try to see if. if he says like I told this person, and try to see if this like the story matches up. Um, for this story, I mean, I admit, like, I only spent a few hours because it's a very, it was a very emergent situation. Mm -hmm. What we did is that uh, because he got an American passport, so there was no visa, like, there's no visa needed, so we crowdsourced, we crowdfunded uh, money to get him to the United States. So, yeah. like, within, like, I tell him, like, by, by 5, I think, like, uh, by 5 a.m., you have to be at the airport. We only have, like, 12 hours. Mm -hmm. And... 
just make sure that you're able to go to the airport and within these 12 hours I'm going to be able to like crowdfund and get you the ticket. Wow, and so a ticket was waiting for him at the airport. Yes. And How are you communicating? Is this done via email? Or? Well, the, in, in some of these closed societies they use apps like uh, WhatsApp and Viber and all of these stuff because they cannot be controlled by the government. Mm -hmm. um, and he does seem to be like a bit of tech savvy that he's able to use what's called VPN mm -hmm. uh, that the government cannot track where his exact location is. Um, and also, I mean, here's what, what the crazy part about this is that if, uh, there's another case happened before by a gal called Hamza Kashgari, and he also like came out as an atheist and he escaped to Malaysia, which is so-called moderate Muslim country. Right. And the Saudi government contacted the Interpol and got him out of the airport there. So Interpol, which is a which is supposedly international organization, international organization to, to defend the human yeah. rights and all of that, they stopped him and get him back to Saudi Arabia. So this guy, because he got an American citizenship, kind of helped in getting him. So he went to Dubai, and from Dubai, he went to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's that's a, this, and now he's actually he's in the United States, and he's in the United States. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's a, a good success story. Yeah, it's a good success story, and that's why I wanted to jump off there with you, because that's what you guys do at movements.org. It's a perfect example yeah. of technology meeting something that's important, because you guys are literally raising money to save secular people and atheists. Yeah, not, not only money. I mean, so the whole system of movements.org, so we crowdsource a human rights. So what we do is we connect activists from closed societies to people in open societies who have the skills to help them. Mm -hmm. So it can be somebody who's looking for a web designer. And women rights activists in Afghanistan want to be published in the media. We have a partnership with the New York Times, the Women in the World. We have a partnership with the Daily Beast, the Huffington Post. So we try to match what the activists in these closed societies want with people who are on the open societies who have the skills to help these specific requests. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like a multi-sided platform. There's requests and there are offers. And then our job is just create a match.com for, <laughs> for skills. Uh, right. And also we have like partnership with people who give organizations that give grants to civil rights organizations and things of that sort. So that's like the main concept of movements. Yeah, so how do you guys make sure that the network of people that you're setting up isn't being infiltrated either by governments or other people that, that want to hurt these people? Yeah, I mean, w w I mean there's, there, it's very impossible to have a 100% secure system. So I'm going to be very honest about yeah. this. I mean, even Facebook and Google and all of these. But we, so we do have a vetting system in which these people who sign up, we ask them to put as much information as possible to be able, for us to be able to verify this information. And also, we ask people from closed societies, and I'm going to go to the definition of closed societies afterwards, is that to use anonymous uh, names and like try to use a username that does not reflect their like their actual location or their real name. Mm -hmm. For people who are in open societies, it's not really a big problem. But mm -hmm. for people who like live in Saudi Arabia, in, uh, in Pakistan, in Iraq, and all these places, they would need to use a username. And they don't give an exact, like they don't say, well, this is my zip code, and this is my address, <laughs> right. and uh, folks, please come and save me. But they can just make a kind of a general request, and then within the, within the messaging service that we have, they can reveal some of the information. And we also have a very strong like security in terms of, of people trying to hack and things of that sort. And I mean, the organization started as a result of funding from Google. So we get that kind of saved in terms of security. We don't have a problem of like big hacking. And, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, it is, it is, it's obviously a possibility that many of these governments, whether it's Iran or Saudi Arabia, would try to use, uh, uh, but we can track whether they try to message people and tell them like, oh, what do you guys do and things of that sort. Also, right. we have the star rating system. So for every user, no matter how, like how much we verify that information, we put them on a star rating system mm -hmm. from like zero stars to five stars. So we ask people if you, if you get messaged by somebody who got v zero stars, you, this person watch out. Watch out. And if if it's five stars, like people like the New York Times or the Huffington Post, so that's so we. I mean, it's it is dependent on the user, and we also try to make them cautious that they. Uh, but as I said, like you cannot prevent uh, all types of attacks from these 
authoritarian governments. Sure, sure. So I want to talk more about the authoritarian governments, but a little bit more about your work first. How much is actually just trying to get these people out versus connecting them with people in the closed societies so that they can actually change their societies from within? Yeah, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that many of the activists we have want to do change in their own countries. Um, there is a significant amount that actually want to get out. Uh, and getting out business is one of the most difficult ones. And I've been, and as, as somebody who is a refugee myself, yeah. um, I had, it took me around three years. And I, I mean, I left Iraq, I went to Lebanon, from Lebanon I went to Malaysia, um, and I had to wait, and then like, from, I left Iraq in 2009, I arrived to the United States in 2013. So it's like, it's a four year process to actually eventually move from a closed societies. So most of the refugees or the people who are trying to save their life, they go through like middle countries. Mm -hmm. Like, so, because you're in your own country, you're mostly in the immediate danger. So many people move, move to like closed countries and then from closed countries move to the West. Mm -hmm. um, so that is extremely difficult process is that it's, uh, but sometimes things change. So, for example, one of the cases I've worked on is the case of the Bengali bloggers. And as a result of we help publishing them at the Daily Beast, they were able to give that article to the Swedish embassy mm -hmm. and receive the visa as a result. Because they told them, like, look, we are lit literally, like, publishing the mainstream media, and, and we, they, are, they are now in Sweden. So is there a risk in a case like that where these bloggers are writing in Bangladesh where we know... People are being killed for this. Just in the last two weeks, several people have yeah. been killed. Is there a risk that when you guys go ahead and publish that, either on Daily Beast or Huffington Post or wherever it is, that that brings more attention to it so that suddenly there's this new crop of people that didn't even know about it that now now wants to kill them? I, I, I wouldn't think so. I mean, I mean, as they say, there's, there's not such a thing as half pregnant. Like, yeah. <laughs> you're either pregnant right, or they're, not. Yeah. Is that yeah. when, when you, I mean, there are like a recent um, tweet by a group called Ansar al-Islam, which is the Al-Qaeda affiliate in Southeast uh, Asia, and they actually like published all the names of the bloggers. Yeah. As like they, like, so they actually stole our idea. They're crowdsourcing terrorism here. <laughs> um, so they are I think like, that's the reverse of yeah. <laughs> they, they got something. They in. got something there, yeah. and they are crowdsourcing terrorism. Is that these are the names of the bloggers, and this and you should it's open source to everybody who wants to go and kill them. So many of uh, I mean, it's it's they're already under threat. So. People when, and actually it's kind of helpful, like at least, I mean, back to my case, is that it helped me that I was published in the mainstream media in terms of uh, getting known and it will be easy to, for me to get a visa. So if you are only published with the local news media, most of the people who like know about the, like the lawyers and stuff will not, will discount that. They will say like, oh, we need something that we can show to American authorities. Like they don't understand Bengali or right. Urdu or any of that sort. So, um, so it is helpful to get published at like mainstream or like American media. And God, I know uh, all these writers in LA that just want to get published for, so they get picked up by an agent. And you're you're dealing with the same thing there, just by by language. Yes, yes, and 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 back yeah back to the concept of crowdsourcing is like so like one of the the case of Bengali so like so he said they sent this article in Bengali and there is another person translated the article from Bengali to English and there is another person edited the article and all these people don't know each other everybody like has a certain skill and then there's the publisher so these three people work together and they don't know each other help publishing the article, and that helped that getting somebody out to Sweden. So, so, that is, so that's the concept of crowdsourcing. Like everybody has a skill that they can contribute collectively to create a great result. Right, so that's the beauty of it, because people think of crowdfunding. And when I first went to the site and I was looking around, I thought it was really just going to be about money. Like we're trying to raise X amount of dollars to get this person out of this country. But really, it's about the skill set and linking people that otherwise yeah. couldn't, couldn't find each other. And for, I mean, for, I mean, for a case like we talked about in about Saudi Arabia, we, like, so we, we depend on partnerships. We're not actually the ones doing the job, but we, we created the platform in which all these people work together. So the, the organization that did the crowdfunding was called Recovery from Religion, which is like, uh, I think, in, the, in Kansas or somewhere in the Midwest. And uh, they raised the funds there, and so all of us like connected together. So the funds go to there, and the users from movements, and yeah, so it's like a circle of people working together to get somebody out. Yeah, it's incredible. So in a case 
like this, like this one that we're talking about with Saudi Arabia, where he had a, uh, so he had an American passport? Yes. So he had an actual American passport. Is this a case, like, why can't they just go to the embassy then? Why, was he afraid to actually just go to the American embassy? I mean, Saudi Arabia is supposed to be our big ally, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, big that's. With these guys, sure, women can't vote and all, and can't drive, but. Yeah, I'm not sure ally. about the ally word here, yeah. But really, um, I mean, so why, what would be the fear, though, of going to the U.S. embassy and claiming asylum or something like that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't think that the embassies give it protections because he's like a Saudi citizen and an American citizen at the same time. And uh, I mean, sometimes, I mean, the, I mean, even these cases of like uh, other other folks, the U.S. embassy doesn't seem to give that much protection from people persecuted by, as you said, allies. Because by, by would, allies, right. So we're not. Yeah, we're so not. that would create a tension. So it's, it's, it was uh, better for him, I mean, just to leave the country and go to, to a safe, to United States, other than get sa safe haven, and I mean, he, I mean, even if he's gonna go to the U.S. embassy, he's gonna still be in Saudi Arabia, so sure. he's gonna still be stuck in inside the embassy. Do you have like a list of the countries? I mean, I'm sure there's a master list of countries that are closed societies, yes. as you guys call them. But what are the countries that are really the most impossible for the secularist or the free thinker or the atheist or all that? Yeah, well, I mean, what we depend on, like, definition of free society, open society, come from an organization called Freedom House. So Freedom House tracks all the countries in terms of freedom of expression, freedom of press, freedom of association. So they have, like, all the countries, and they try to put, uh, try to do reports on them on a yearly basis to see which ones get advanced, which one get worse. So, I mean, when it comes to the worst, I mean, I would put Saudi Arabia as the worst. Uh, Again, Iran, our ally. Our, yeah, our, our favorite ally, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Pakistan and uh, Iran. I mean, that's, I call them the axis of evil. <laughs> but, uh, so that's, and uh, I mean, obviously North Korea, but that's, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, being anything in North Korea <laughs> is a problem, other than being a believer in the dear supreme leader of the or dear leader of, of North Korea. So, sure. so I, would, I mean, North Korea is probably like the closest society we know we know of at the moment. And uh, I think there's um, Tajikistan, not uh, Turkmenistan in Central Asia, and uh, this is kind of like the most difficult. And also, it depends on. The strength of, uh, there's something called strength of the passport. So, like, for example, me as somebody who's in Iraqi, like, Iraqi passport doesn't get me anywhere. Like, there are only few countries that get me in without a visa. And that's the countries I went to, like mm -hmm. Lebanon and Malaysia. Like, when I applied to the United Kingdom, they rejected me, saying that they require, like, thousands of pounds in my savings account and touch for six months. So, yeah. Really? So, it's, it's very difficult for countries that have, that they require a lot of, visa, like they require a visa for every country they go to, uh, to leave that country. But, but for countries like, which are in the Gulf region, uh, sometimes it's easier for them to get a visa elsewhere. So there's the passport also plays a role in how to get people out.